Hey, how's it going, guys? Uh, I know this is my second video of the day, so sorry for spamming up everybody's feeds, but uh, a little bit ago, uh, there was a little bit of request for Wizard Magazine, so got out my Wizard Magazines, so just to kind of talk about all the fun Wizard stuff from the 90s. So, you know, we always talk about, you know, all the 90s covers and the shiny ones and the chromium and the see-through ones, uh, but there is no other magazine or book more 90s to me than Wizard Magazine. Um, so I guess I'll just start showing the covers because I have so many and I'll probably pop one open and just kind of flip through it just to show you guys, you know, what Wizard Magazine was all about. So basically, um, in the 90s before the internet was really big and everything, if you guys don't know already, um, Wizard was a, the main place to go for a lot of information comic book related. Um, and that includes pricing too. Hey, what's up, comic bags? Glad you can make it. Um, so more or less, if you need to know any comic news, uh, prices, that type of stuff, Wizard Magazine, for the most part, was the place to go. Uh, there was always a little bit of controversy with Wizard, uh, but I always enjoyed it as a kid. Uh, like I said, definitely, you know, as eBay was growing in the mid-90s and, you know, cons were starting to come up a little bit more. And, you know, the trade scene was bigger than ever after the 90s boom and the 90s crash and all that stuff. So the best place to go was probably for me Wizard Comics or Comics Magazine. I think a lot of them, my run is from like 94 through 97, 98. Um, and they had a lot of good cover artists too. Like here's a, uh, uh, are these still around? Uh, unfortunately not. They're, they've focused more on uh, their website and the convention scene, which I'll get to that here in a minute. Um, but yeah, back in the 90s, these things, you would catch them on, I, I didn't even collect these in comic stores. Most of them were like found in grocery store shelves with the other magazines and stuff. Um, and here's an awesome Alex Ross cover. Um, and then they eventually got to the point where they were all like this thick. And a lot of it, they, they went toward a lot of pricing and stuff like that, so almost, this much of the book was just a price guide and it gets even bigger the further you go into the hundreds eventually they stopped that because i'm sure they were taking a killing on printing um but yeah actually i might focus on this one because it's a 300 page year in spectacular they did these like at the end of every year um and there's a lot of other cool stuff they featured too so they it was like the one of the first magazines i remember that really featured um, talking about the writers and the artists and the project the writers and the artists were working on uh, rather than, you know, a direction of the character, which they would uh, shine light on that too. But they did their best to make the, you know, the, the writers and the artists look like superstars. Um, and that also kind of went into, you know, them building their convention scene, more or less, uh, because, you know, they would highlight all these people in the magazine and like, oh, these people like come and see them at, so-and-so convention in Chicago or Philly. Um, another thing that I always thought was cool in Wizards is they'd always have these like uh, one-half issues that they would try to sell. And they're usually, I guess, what's the price on this? Like, oh, actually this one says it was free back then plus $2 shipping. So they eventually raised that price. Um, but back in the day, like these uh, Wizard One Halves were very collectible. So after a while, I got to the point where, like, if I knew the book or not, I would just rip like this part out and send it in and get my comic. Like if I remember right, like I think X Files One Half uh, was the most valuable one for it. It was like a forty or fifty dollar book in the late nineties. Right now, you could probably get into the dollar bin. <laughs> so just to kind of give you an idea of how much this stuff has gone up and down. Uh, but I always loved the old 90s ads for like PlayStation 1 and <laughs> and 64 games too. There's a lot of cool ads. It's been a while since I flipped through one of these, so I'm kind of just enjoying it as I'm flipping through it. It looks like this magazine came out around the Age of Apocalypse time. Um, so there's that. Which I remember it was super hyped up by the time that came out. And here they describe like what the books are replacing and that stuff. So I always thought that was pretty cool how they actually had stuff that explained that. And they always did like these like fan castings and stuff too before, you know, there was every single character had their own movie. 
Um, they'd always have like the occasional fan casting or like that. I think there's actually one where they do cast X-Men number one. Um, and that was pretty cool. Like I said, I, I wish I had more details on exactly where I remember. Um, the old ones actually came with a toy price guide too before they started their toy magazine. Um, I think it's called Toy Biz or something like that. I never collected the toy magazine because like I said, I was young at the time. I definitely didn't have the money for boxed toys and comic books and everything else. Um, actually, here's a feature for the Wildcats animated series. That was very short-lived. I think it was on CBS Saturday mornings. So that was pretty awesome. Old Jim Lee. He's on like every other page of this thing. Like an actual picture of him. <laughs> Um, and actually, yes, yeah, like I said, they they were getting out of hand a little while with all the pricing guides and stuff. Like, here's a card guide for, like, just, you know, just magic cards, Batman cards. Apparently, the Malibu Ultraverse had a line of cards. Who would have thought? So, Bloodlines DC. Actually, my buddy just bought the, the Bloodlines DC box at C2E2. I didn't realize it was valued in here. Hey, what's up, Elk? Is your room flip? Huh. Well, hope not. <laughs> Hopefully the, the live feed's going well. Um, so this is my right hand if <laughs> there's a question about it. If it is, I apologize. Um, but yeah, they had a whole... I didn't realize they had the whole card guide inside here at one point, too. Um, and then they'd always have a feature of what was coming out that month and that type of stuff, so... Dark Empire 2 number 1 came out in 1995 when this was released, so I remember reading that. That was pretty cool. Let's see what else came out. Uh, Angela number 1, artist Greg Capula, but that was awesome. Yeah, maybe it's me. I've had been having some weird problems with my phone lately, Elk, so like I said, if there's something weird going on, I apologize. Uh, it seemed like my other video that wasn't live went well this morning, so... <laughs> Hopefully this one is going well too in terms of quality and stuff. Thought about actually upgrading the camera. So if anyone has any suggestions, let me know. Um, sorry, now I'm just actually reading. Things. Oh, here's what I wanted to get to. The uh, they always had the Wizard Top 100, like the 100 books that month, and they usually have a separate top 10 of more or less like spec books and stuff. So in, let's see, January of 1995. X-Men Deluxe 40 was the number one. I'm just assuming it was X-Men 40. I don't know why they put X-Men Deluxe 40. It might have been, I, I think I remember like Marvel had like a regular version of a book, then Deluxe version. I know they did it with Wolverine. It was like, like one of those fold-out covers. Uh, so in January 95, X-Men number 40 was the number one book, followed by Spawn 26. Then Uncanny X-Men 320 was number three. Generation X number three broke the top five. It was number four. That's kind of crazy to think about. Just how big Generation X was in the 90s. I remember they had that uh, Fox uh, TV exclusive movie. Um, and it's just like they, they even have like an X Men movie at the time. Generation X had a movie before the X Men. That's just, I just kind of forgot about that till just now. Yeah, like I said, Wolverine 89's on here. Rogue number one. Wetworks number four. Wow, Wetworks broke the top ten. That's impressive. This is above Wildcats during that Alan Moore run. So Wildcats was number eight. Uh, there was a Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Probably the first comic they did of that was number nine and Bishop number two. And then I guess the, the dubious honors. So, <laughs> because why not? Uh, at number 100 was Star Trek Deep Space Nine slash Next Generation number two for Malibu. Um, oh, thanks, Elk. I'll have to look that up after the video. Uh, very much appreciated because I, I definitely need to upgrade here because I've got I just got my phone leaning against a computer I don't like basically <laughs> if you guys ever wondered how I do that um, but yeah I'm just definitely looking for something maybe I can sell some of these crazy books and then buy an upgrade uh, New Warriors 55 was 99 uh, something called the X Men Spectacular is 98 Vamps number six from DC Comics is 97. 96 was, wow, wow, Justice League was way down there. Um, Justice League American 95 was 96, so, dang. Hey, what's up, Miss Hustle? Um, but, man, I, I forgot how bad the Justice League got in the 90s. Like, I think it wasn't until issue 100 they at least brought Wonder Woman back to the team to try to boost the, uh, the ratings, if you will, a little bit. But I think it was pretty much after... I think Grant Morrison joined. That's when the book got the shot in the arm it needed. 
Uh, they did a reboot as a 97, but in 95, it was rated 96 on Wizards Top 100. So, dang, that's really low. Okay, so the top 10 comics, according to Wizard, in 95. So, of course, number one, Gen 13. I mean, you're going to be probably seeing that a lot in these books. So, Gen 13, number one, was the number one book, which is no surprise to me at all. Uh, because that that was like the hottest book in the 90s besides after spawn had its thing coming out <laughs> team nerdy <laughs> uh, no problems miss hustle uh, number two is she number one the bill uh, william tucci book um, like i said that was one of the bigger independents in the 90s so no surprise there right below it, lady death number one so some good old chaos comics uh, they hit the scene big in the 90s so the, like i said all these books are going for Easy double digits for a while. Then Gen 13, number two. So you didn't see a lot of number twos on these countdowns. Hey, what's up, Houdet? <laughs> I was waiting for your live stream to end to start mine. So glad you could make it, sir. Uh, Generation X, number one. Once again, like I said, Generation X. They were big in the 90s. That nice uh, chromium cover wraparound. Uh, Vengeance of Vampirilla, number one, was six. Uh, Zoro, number three, had this awesome Mike Mayhew cover. Um... Topps Comics. I don't know if all of you guys have heard of Topps Comics out there, but that was one of their properties they had. Uh, they would eventually have X Files, Zorro, and just a few. It was kind of like out Dynamite Comics then, more or less. Yeah, First Lady Rawhide, they had that. Um, number eight was Flash 92. That's the first impulse. I'm still looking for that book, actually. I always wanted to find it in a dollar bin because I always see 91, 93 through 100 of that Mark Wade run. But I never can find Flash 92, The First Impulse. Uh, one of, just one of those weird books that's eluded me for whatever reason. I don't think it goes for tons of money. Um, but it'd be nice to have. But I'm not going to break the bank over it. It's Flash 92. Uh, Wonder Woman 88, that awesome uh, Brian Boland cover was number 9. And number 10 was She number 2. So the selling power of She... And they always had like they always like to show charts and graphs in these things too. Like who had the market share and stuff. Uh, so Marvel, 33% looks like on the uh, whole diet. The, I guess it, back then it was a capital city distribution. Then DC, then Image was actually really close to DC in the 90s. So DC was 18.59%, whereas Image was 14.14. So they were just nipping at the heels. Yeah, this is the, uh, the year-end spectacular, 300 pages, Elk. Oh, uh, here's what I was talking about, too. They always also like the feature of the, uh, the top 10 writers and artists. And they always had these, like... Uh, pictures of them um, that they always love to feature in these things. Eventually, they got like screen cat, or they, they basically took like school style pictures of these guys at the conventions, and it always cracked me up. Um, so, looks like the hot 10 artist was number one was Todd McFarlane, which he was almost always number one in these wizard magazines. They love Todd McFarlane. Um, number two, Stephen Platt for Profit. Number three was Frank Miller. He was doing his, he was in the middle of his big Sin City run then. Uh, number four, Greg Capullo. Oh man, look how awesome Greg Capullo looks. He's got like a spawn baseball cap on and an awesome mustache. Oh man. Uh, Joe Casada, number five. Uh, Andy Kubert, number six for his X-Men work, which I still collect those books today. Wills Portacio, seven for Wetworks. Uh, the Young and Chipper, Adam Hughes at number eight. Number nine, Adam Kubert. Number 10, Jeff Smith for Bone. And then the writers, they put Frank Miller, Peter David, Neil Gaiman, John Byrne, Jeff Smith, Chris Claremont, Ron Mars for Green Lantern, Fabian Nicesia, Scott Lobdell, and John Ostrander. So, And I always thought there was a little bit of controversy behind the Hot 10 list eventually because you'd eventually see like the same people on there. And sometimes those people won't even be putting out a book that month. Like, you'd still have Todd McFarlane on there, and he would, like, Spawn would be delayed by a month or two. Uh, so it was always kind of funny to see, you know, exactly what, who would be on there and why. Uh, so here's the price guide. And like I said, the, the, they got thicker by the year, basically. So they just started off, they'd basically be featured, like, uh, just normal whatever came out the like within a five-year window or a ten-year window more or less but then i guess they're like oh people keep asking us how much like action comics number one is and detective 27 and eventually they just try to include all of that and it got pretty nuts like half the book was a price guide after that on a monthly basis so like i said they eventually i felt like they almost all got this thick 
So I guess just an example of what books are worth in the 90s. <laughs> uh, let's see. That's a good one here that's probably up or down. You can get Akira number one for 22 bucks apparently in 95. Uh, Alpha Flight. Wow, those Alpha Flights sold for anything besides a dollar in the 90s? Wow. I guess issue one was worth four fifty, and then issue thirteen was worth eight bucks. Wow, I did not realize that. New Mutants ninety eight here. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Oh, yeah, let's start looking up the big boy books here. I guess they were like you know in junior high back then instead of being big boys. <laughs> New Mutants. See, there's always inserts in these things too. Uh, dang. New Mutants ninety eight. All right, so. New Mutants 98. You know what's... Oh, that, it, it says, the listing says, uh, first appearance of Domino slash Vanessa. Oh, it does say Deadpool, finally. <laughs> I think they left out Deadpool. And then first Gideon, so he's just like a run-of-the-mill character by this point. Uh, $11.50. So you could have got your copy of that for $11.50. And uh, just so you guys know as well, uh, New Mutants 87, first Cable... Uh, first Drive Freedom Force, worth 40 bucks in 1995. So there you go. Easy peasy to get in 95, I guess you could say. Uh, actually, then even the first appearance of Deathstroke was worth 20 bucks. <laughs> so that's pretty awesome. Uh, Ninjack, Ninjack number one. The gold edition was worth 50 bucks. Wow. Even back then, those uh, gold valiants, they were always selling for... I wonder how much Spawn number one was. I bet that was really high back then. So let's see, spawn, spawn, spawn. Wow, sorry, I just Sandman number one caught my sixty-one dollars fifty cents. So that really hasn't changed a lot in twenty plus years. So that's kind of crazy. Uh, the Sandman Mystery Theaters, their cover price then less than that now. Spawn, where did you go? See, like I said, these things got longer. Usually, you just go from like one thing to boom, spawn. Uh, Sorry, I keep getting distracted by other things. Uh, $17,000 for a uh, showcase number four. That caught my eye. All right, so you could have got a spot number one for 13 bucks. That's still pretty high for 95. I figured it'd be like right around five or 10, but I guess I'm crazy. It was the, uh, no, it's actually, that's still cover price too. Um, number eight, which I don't think was credited as the first appearance of Hey, what's up, comic boys? I don't think it was credited as the first appearance of Angela yet, or no one cared about Angela, but it was like a, it was cover price. So kind of amazing to see that. So uh, unless you guys have any other requests, I'll get out of the old uh, price guide and just keep showing the other covers to these things. So you're probably tired of staring at my goofy face. And I always like looking at these uh, convention ads too, just to see you know what the cons were like then. STS guys, what's up? Uh, let's see, yeah, Todd McFarlane, he's going to be at the top of all of these, of course. Greg Capullo, Bart Sears, then the whole homage studio of J. Scott Campbell and Brett Booth and their buddies. So, yeah, sometimes it would be nice to travel back in time to the 90s and start buying some books and going from there. Yeah, have a good night, Elk. Thanks for uh, coming by. Next one I'll show is number 39. Got a nice Spawn cover there. Don't know if that's a Capullo or a McFarlane or not. Oh yeah, Capullo's awesome at cons, isn't he? I, I met him a couple times. Uh, the latest was uh, last year in Cincinnati. He's a super nice guy. Um, actually, I guess I didn't cash in my XO Man of War half, unfortunately. I wonder if the price fluctuated on that. Yeah, still two bucks to get it shipped to you. Yeah, him and Snyder are awesome. Snyder's like one of the nicest people I've ever met at a convention. Um, I've gotten so many things signed by him. He's, he is the man. <laughs> uh, like I said, and just the funny thing is, like the nice he are at conventions, the odds are I'm probably going to leave that convention and buy that person's book. So uh, that's why I don't get sometimes. Yeah, XO, Man of War. <laughs> I guess I'll uh, send this to you, Cowboy, so you can go order it for two bucks <laughs> off Wizard Press. So. Uh, honestly, comic bags, I haven't read Spawn since the 90s. I know a lot of people uh, really like it, obviously, with the um, Greg Capullo was on there for an eternity. Um, and I think there's like a run, I can't remember. Maybe it's like 180 on up. Those are pretty sought after. They had a lot of covers. 
that people are like like there's like a lot of swipe covers basically a lot of people are trying to recollect those and those are starting to go up on the uh, aftermarket and all that good stuff uh, so here's X-Men 49 <laughs> Wizard 49 with the X-Men sorry Sweet Judge Dread cover Batman and Robin and Azrael. Always got, got to love the old Tim Drake 90s Robin. That's my favorite Robin version right there. I guess if I could pick one. I like this cover. It's got a nice rogue cover on it. Psylocke is buried behind the, uh, the old uh, trade dress there. Oh, hey, what's up? Uh, Rich slash Chad, whichever one has the control of the account. Uh, reviews from the Batcave. Thanks for watching. Um, I'll try Oh, yeah. Since you joined the chat just now, boom. Unite the Seven, Friday, 10 p.m. So hopefully it kind of shows up right there, but uh, be there, please. Next up, awesome Catwoman cover, Wizard 33. Huge Liefeld cover, Wizard 37. Rob Liefeld, Youngblood. And I guess I'll go... I think this is the last one I picked out. I got more of my collection. Like, I don't even know how many of these wizards I have. Like, I've, I mean, I probably collected, like, at least four or five years worth. There are two magazines I really enjoyed in the 90s. It was Wizard and Nintendo Power were my two magazines, besides all the comics I got, of course. Uh, oh, nice. This one's a nice gatefold cover. So, looks like it's Spidey fighting the Lizard and Venom and Doc Ock and Hobgoblin. So, pretty awesome cover there. I went in, there's an advertisement for Zero Hour. This is the first crossover I was ever able to collect as a kid. So I was super excited when Zero Hour was coming out because I had no idea what it was, uh, who half the characters were at the time. So it was, it, I can't really ever recreate that experience of reading a major crossover like that and wondering and trying to put all the pieces together to try to figure out what was going on. But it was an absolute amazing time for me to read comics. Let's just say that. Um, I was hoping to find one of those goofy fan casting things, but I haven't rolled across it yet. Maybe I'll look at one of the later ones here in a second. Yeah, as a, oh, and then sometimes, speaking of Nintendo Power, they like to have their like little, little fold-out posters, too, and that stuff. And usually Wizard took it to the next level, so I'm like supposed to rip this thing out, and then it folds in half. I'm pro probably cut it out, but I don't picture myself hanging this up. So if anyone needs a Rob Liefeld poster, hey, I got one right here. Looks like some young blood. Let's just get to the uh, top 10 here, see if I can find it real quick. Oh, here we go. All right, so July 1994, the top 10 comics. Like the most collectible ones, basically. It's not the ones that sold the best, it's the basically the, the back market ones. So Supreme number 12 from Rob Liefeld was, yeah, even <laughs> they've been putting like question marks and exclamation points. Like Supreme number 12 is number one, really? <laughs> So Supreme number 12 was the first book, so that's very interesting. Uh, Death Blow number 5. Oh, that's cool. Tim, I didn't realize Tim Sale did any work on Death Blow. Uh, but that was another uh, Jim Lee book in the 90s, basically, from Image that he worked into his Wildstorm print. Uh, Kindred 3A is a Brett Bruth, another Jim Lee book, basically. Uh, he was Him and Brandon Choi wrote a lot of books together. And then, of course, on that, once again, Gen 13 number 1. Oh yeah, 90s image, man. Like it was definitely its own beast. I, like I said, I really enjoyed collecting 90s image at the time, but I think I said this in my videos before. I think I've hit my quota collecting 90s image. Like I've got more than enough. There's probably like maybe one or two. I think it was just independently published. So Wizard was its own beast, basically. Um, yeah, as long as I yeah, in that huge poster, I don't think there's one foot comic boys. So I think he passed the test on that. Yeah, then Lady Death, Prophet 4A, uh, another Liefeld book. Uh, she, number one, was number seven, so that was climbing in the rankings. Vengeance of Van Perilla, number eight. Gen 13, number two, was nine. And then those are the miniseries, by the way, of Gen 13. They eventually had their own ongoing. Uh, but when that miniseries came out, all, well, I guess technically it was six books. They had a zero through five. But all those books were on fire, like, as soon as I remember them all coming out. And then uh, Marvel's number two, that uh, Kurt Busiek, Alex Roth book. Very good. Very good book. Awesome art. Uh, cool premise. I might actually have to review that sometime. I kind of just 
had it in the back of my mind until I saw a picture of it just now. So, uh, let's see what the market share was. Looks like DC was at 21%. Marvel, 28.56. Image, 12.15. And others, whatever others means, is 26.41. So, it was kind of crazy how, you know, anymore it seems like Marvel takes up like 50% of the pie. And DC will be like a good second half of a pie and then everybody else will be crammed into one so it's a very diverse market in the 90s so very interesting to see how all that's changed and how some of it's actually stayed the same and then once again like i said the the top 10 writers and artists this is almost a carbon copy of what i should i think the only person added that wasn't in the previous one was mark silvestri which is at number nine so very interesting there how like i said they Oh, and John Ostrander actually got on the writer's list at 8. So, like I said, they had their boys, if you will. So, the boys were always on the top 10s, even. I guess we could uh, time jump here. So, this was from 1994. I think I thought I had one more current than this. 115. That's like it was 115 real quick. And this was in two, April of 2001. So, the X-Men movie was about to hit the scene in a big way in uh Pretty much by May or June 2001, I believe. Um, first off, you got a PS2 ad for the Bouncer. I always thought this guy in the Bouncer looked like Sora from Kingdom Hearts, and I think, yeah, it's a SquareSoft game. So I always thought that was a little weird. <laughs> how the, this dude, like eventually Square and all them, made Kingdom Hearts, uh, that Disney game, all those fun characters from Final Fantasy as well. But I was just like, nah, it looks like they stole a lot of their designs from the Bouncer before they. You know, after they had that game. And actually, I think there's probably going to be a big feature on Spider-Man, one of the movies in here, too. Yep, there it is right there. Sam Raimi's uh, Spider-Man. This will be the following year in 2002. Uh, so it's always kind of interesting to see these articles about, you know, like these big movies I remember now before they came out. So I'm guessing if I dug deep enough, I could find one on X-Men. Um... But yeah, there's like the very, wow, look at those, that young cast of Spider-Man 1. <laughs> so they all look so different now, obviously, but yeah, this is like, I guess, as soon as they announced the cast. So that's pretty cool. I said, at the very least, the Wizard Magazines, they're not very collectible for what I'm to understand, but they're definitely a very cool time capsule into what the, you know, 90s collecting was like. Um, it almost be kind of like if you researched an old website that just never updated and is there for archival purposes. Um, oh, Wizard targets the 10 most brutal comics you can get your bloody hands on. So let's see what they thought the top 10 most brutal comics in 2001 were. So number one, or actually they, they got in reverse order here. Oh, and there's a top 10. So uh, number 10 is Wolverine, which yeah, I guess you could say that it was published by Marvel. So Marvel in, you know, 2000, they basically, they weren't going to have these bloody, insane comics. But, you know, with Wolverine, they still pushed it as far as they could get. Uh, Savage Drag is number nine. Sam and Twitch is number eight. Akira is number seven. Hellblazer is number six. Uh, so the top five, number five would be The Punisher. That's the start of that Garth Ennis run. So definitely understand that one. Uh, number four, uh, awesome book, Transmetropolitan. That's on my highly recommended list of books to read if you guys haven't read that. Uh, number three, wow, Lone Wolf and Cub gets some recognition in here. So there you go, Lone Wolf and Cub is the number three most brutal book. Uh, number two, 100 Bullets, which, yeah, that, that book is brutal. Um, sorry, I'm getting distracted by an ad for Soul Survivors. So eh, there you go, <laughs> Elijah Dushku in the uh, 2000s. Uh, yeah, we'll just skip that. Number one is the authority. So, uh, like I said, they like to push the image stuff as much as possible. So, the authority gets the number one spot, which probably should have went to a couple of those other books, but man, it's not too bad either. Oh, here's a cool article about uh, the Ultimate Universe, actually. So, uh, this is probably published, what, one year into the Ultimate stuff? Maybe not even that. Probably came out maybe before. The year all this stuff out slightly escapes me right now, but this is probably some of the first art featured for the Ultimate Universe, so that's pretty cool. So, of course, they interviewed Bendis and Mark Millar for that. Maybe it was a year after. 
I think it was a year after uh, the Ultimate stuff started to launch. Oh, finally, a casting call. I've been looking through multiple issues looking for this casting call. So what Wizard would do, this almost became a monthly feature for him. Oh, yeah, come up, Banks, check out Ultimate Spider-Man. Oh, one of my top books ever. A great 100-issue run from Bendis on that and Mark Bagley. Check it out. Uh, but anyway, they, they like to have these casting calls, like if a movie is going to happen and, you know, they would put their two cents on who's going to play what. Um, so basically, they cast a Titans movie, <laughs> and their pick for Nightwing was Tom Cruise. So I don't even think in 2001 he was that young, let alone now, obviously, but to play Nightwing. I guess he had, he has the height of, like, a carny basically so he would i guess like late 90s tom cruise would have made a decent looking nightwing uh but i just could never picture that i don't know who brooke langston is is you know donna troy i never let's see what she's from oh the replacements so she was she was the head cheerleader in that keanu reeves movie the replacements uh, i don't know who tempest is either never heard of that guy Elizabeth Rom is Jesse Quick. Yeah, she could, probably could have made that work. That was she was an angel in uh, Law and Order, um, so that would have been interesting to see Jesse Quick in a movie way back when. And Sean Patrick Flannery is Arsenal. So, I like said just a small example of what the they usually. Oh yeah, there is one more page. They, sometimes they cast the villains and stuff. So, Sean Connery's Deathstroke. That would have been awesome to see. I'll admit that. Like I, of all these fan castings, that that's a pretty legit pick right there. Um, especially because I kind of think. Sean Connery from The Rock. It was like that era, so that would have been pretty cool, actually. Uh, Denise Richards is Starfire. Solid pick there. She can be a Bond woman. I guess she can be Starfire. And Kelly Hugh is Cheshire. Not bad casting there. She was, I think, uh, her in X2. Uh, so that, let's see. We wanted to do one more top ten, and then I'll start getting in a couple of things and then wrap this up. Yeah, <laughs> I was talking about spawn number one earlier. They actually like a little chart showing spawn number one. Uh, then actually, I think this was once grading started becoming a big thing, like right at the cusp of like the beginning of CGC. So you can see people were paying out the wazoo once uh, books were starting to get graded 9.8 and stuff. Obviously not like that now, but this is according to this. Like a 10.0 copy of spawn number one sold for $810. Now, maybe if it was... Uh, 10.0 copy it probably would sell just because those things don't come easy all right so the hot 10 comics for 2001 april number one and like i said i was i was wrong earlier the ultimate universe was a thing by now uh ultimate spider-man one was the number one book it, they specifically said the white cover green arrow 137 i believe that was at the very end of the initial Green Arrow run, so they're getting ready to bring back Oliver Queen, basically. So I think, not Roy Harper. Oh God, I'm trying to think of that one Green Arrow's name. His name escapes me because I didn't read his run. I think it was Connor Hawk, maybe was Green Arrow. So that was the end of the Connor Hawk run of Green Arrow. Number three is uh, Spider-Man Two. It says B, which I thought B was that car variant, but yeah, whatever. Uh, Spidey Ultimate X Special is number four. Planetary number three was five. Lone Wolf and Cub at number one is six. Ultimate X Men was seven. Blink number one is eight. Well, I actually put a trade on here. <laughs> uh, Nick Fury Agents of Shield trade that Starinko run was number nine. Oh, I didn't know I had a shiny cover for that. Superman 166 was ten. Apparently, there was a. Uh, 90s-ified chromium cover on that. I will, might actually have to look for that. That sounds awesome. That's a really good book, actually. <laughs> it's the, the, one of the best uh, Jeb Blow of Ed McGinnis books there is out there. So, Like I said, I always find these fascinating. And then top 50 for this month in terms of sales. Uh, X-Men 110, so X-Men was still thriving, especially with the movie that came out. Um right around this corner everyone was specking on x-men so everyone was picking up everything that came out so the top four books are all x-men titles so you got x-men 110 uncanny 390 and ultimate x-men number two and then wolverine 160. um so then it's avengers 38 
Punisher 12, which we Garth Ennis was starting to you know hit his stride there. Spawn 106, so Spawn was still going strong then. Uh, Kevin Smith took over Daredevil, I believe, at this point. So the spots of 8 and 9 are Daredevil 16 and 15, which I think he was off the title, but I think it was... Uh, it went like Kevin Smith, and I think David Mack was writing and drawing it himself, and then I think Bendis comes in right after that. So, uh, so then Ultimate Spider-Man is the uh, number ten. So, like I said, if you guys see these in like quarter bins, it's cool to buy one and just flip through it. Uh, but just in terms of the history and what Wizard meant to the '90s and stuff, I mean, this is how I decided what I was gonna buy before the internet was picking up Wizards and stuff. Um, but I want to talk about the convention scene as well because I think the Wizard conventions are very important as well. So if you guys didn't know, Wizard more or less started as a magazine company. Then they ran the Wizard World show circuit. And basically that's what they're doing today. And I think, you know, they've been bought out, trade up, whatever. Because I think there was a guy named Garib Sheamus uh, who owned all of this. And then he also would run the conventions and then he decided to cancel the magazine focus slow, solely on conventions. That's why probably about 2010, 2015, within that five-year window, you see they, they used to have four conventions and then now they spiked it to like one, maybe even two a month in the summer. So you get like 12 to 20 Wizard Worlds now instead of just four after the magazine folded. And then I, I don't know if all the other ones did like Toy Biz and then uh, I think what was Inquest was the card magazine, I think. They used to have three magazines at one time, and then they had just Wizard it again, I think, and then I think they're all just out and in conventions. Uh, but like I said, they used to have cool giveaways or conventions, like hardcover books. Like, I got this Spider-Man Masterpiece Edition. Um, cool Mike Mayhew cover on that, and this collects just a couple Bronze Age Spider-Man. So this one uh, is the Nothing Can Stop the Juggernaut Run, which is Spider-Man 229 through 230. Uh, then 231 through 232, Hide and Seek, Roger Stern, John Romero Jr. on that. And then the uh, Death of Gene DeWolf, which is spectacular, 107 through 110, which is a really good Peter David read. Actually, I think I got this signed. Yeah, I got it signed by John Romero Jr., Peter David, and Mike Mayhew. Um, so just an example of people you could have met at the Wizard World convention. I think all three of those guys were at this convention I got this book at. And I was talking about Sylvester earlier. They even would have these hardcover uh, art books, more or less. And uh, actually, I think it's more than an art book. It's been a while since I flipped through this one, too. It has just like a lot of uh, printed interviews from the Wizard magazines that Mark Sylvester did. So pretty much anything that Sylvester had his name on in the, the magazines, I believe, is reprinted in this... Uh, Millennium Edition. <laughs> like I said, Wizard liked to uh, put out as many random things as possible, it seemed like, for a while. So there's a hardcover Mark Silvestri book about just interviews and stuff. Um, then I only, I think it was my brother's, but he left it in my collection of this stuff for some reason. Just a Kevin Smith spectacular. So there's probably, like, when I started going to these uh, Wizard conventions, probably about 2003, there was no bigger name than Kevin Smith. Like, he had all the indie cred from Clerks, and that stuff it sounds like Marvel. Yeah, exactly. Marvel and their cash grabs. That's a good way to put it. Um, so there was no bigger name in the early 2000s in comics than Kevin Smith. He went from Clerks uh, to Mallrats, Chasing Amy, Dogma. And then for some reason, you know, his name got bigger and bigger. And, you know, I guess not Hollywood, because you could say, because he always wanted to remain independent. Uh, but he decided, like, I like comic books. Yes, it is comic books. Clerks is absolutely amazing. He's like, I don't like comic books. I'm going to write comic books instead of go make my next movie, basically. So once he did his Daredevil run, like, he got even bigger in the light of comic book fans. So um, this Silent Bob, he was, like, the number one most cosplayed person before cosplay was a thing. I'd go to these cons and see, like, 20 Silent Bobs because it's just husky guy in a coat with a beard. That was, like, the look in 2003 at these cons, so... It's always kind of funny to think back how you only see like one now, but it was like multiplied by 20 or 30. And then I just found this in my collection. It's just some sort of zero hour featurette. I think I bought this at a grocery store when I was a kid. Came bagged and all that stuff. Like you, like you said, it's like Marvel and the cash grabs. Wizard was like first about cash grabs. Don't even know why it's like, oh, first edition with a nice little foil thing. Like I doubt there was ever a second edition of this, but they still wanted to make it look like legit. And then you always get like freebies too, as you saw like by the bags and stuff. Um, this is just one of the freebies that was in there. Like you get cards and free comics and um, 
if you guys ever remember the Age of Apocalypse, which I mentioned earlier, um, they actually had the entire issue of the uh, the issue before the Age of Apocalypse that showed how they got there. Can't remember the X Men title right now, but it was actually sought after for a minute because it had like a gold X Men logo, and it was like how Legion caused the Age of Apocalypse, basically. So you'd always get like free stuff, like posters, comic books, and that stuff. Uh, so the last thing, like I said, I'll keep talking about the uh, convention circuit, which I thought I grabbed a couple of the uh, convention. Oh, here they go. Sorry. Um, grabbed a couple of the uh, pamphlets I got from the conventions. I like to keep these. and Like, a, for instance, at, uh, the first Wizard World Chicago I went to 2004, I actually tried to get like almost everyone I signed or everyone I met to get a signature on here. So actually a few of these are signed and then I'll just pop. The first one I went to open. So the first convention I went to was Wizard World, Texas in 2003. Yeah, I know, Murph, I don't have my one-half issues on me. <laughs> I was going to uh, show them, but I think, I think you're the one who made fun of me last time. I think they're all actually at my parents' house, like in a big stack. Uh, uh, yeah, Wonder Woman. Um, but I had uh, the X-Files one-half was like mind-blowing when I got that one because it was like very highly sought after for a minute. And then Gen 13 one-half is probably the other one that held its value for a minute. Uh, but anyway, <clears throat> this is the first convention I went to. Uh, was World Texas 2003. Uh, just so kind of a little idea who was there. So Kevin Smith, of course, like I said, he was a staple at the early Wizards uh, quite a bit. Allison Mack, which we probably don't want to talk about anymore. She's been in a lot of trouble lately. And actually, I think she is currently incarcerated for sex trafficking or something. So, uh, yeah, I guess it's good we didn't meet her. And then uh, George Perez was there, too, as the guest of honor. Had, uh, yeah, exactly, Murph. She's screwed. <laughs> don't get involved in those sex cults, whatever you do. <laughs> trying to figure out who else was at this convention so they'd always have like a lot of staple names there it's like mark Silvestri went to a ton of the original ones uh mike turner was at a lot of them joe casada jim lee uh, actually i think this is the only one i went to that jim lee was actually there his line was huge of course imagine that <laughs> like it is like the first time i ever saw like a creator line wrapped like all the way around the building i think he might have only not it says all three days but i think he was only there one day after this was printed but yeah, the main reason I went to this, my brother lived in Texas at the time, and he's like, we got he he had to go meet Jay and Silent Bob, which were, you know, one of the, the main things in attendance. But it's just kind of weird flipping through these older ones, uh, just because like here's the celebrity page, and I think this is it. Like right now, like if you print one of these now, number one, it'd be on like a piece of paper instead of like a nice comic book shaped program, uh, going to a wizard, and it'd be 99% celebrities and like 2% comics, whereas. The celebrities were relegated to one page, and the comic people are on multiple pages. So, just to kind of show you how the last 15 years have changed in terms of wizard conventions. Like I said, they went from four to like 24 or something, and they're always canceling ones and adding new ones. And uh, last I heard, though, I don't know how much longer the wizard thing is going to be. Uh, this is all hearsay, but I guess they're only making money on. Uh, Chicago and Philly still. I don't know if any of the new cities they found they're making a lot of money. Um, so there's a lot of speculation that Wizard World may not be a thing five years from now. So we'll see. Um, I hope they succeed, to be honest. I know a lot of people are sour on Wizard Worlds nowadays just because, you know, they, they like to segregate the celebrities, which are the main draw. Uh, I think, what did I say Spawn 1 was worth, guys? Like $12.50, I think, in 95 uh, was what it said. Uh, and then your new mutants 90. Hey, what's up, poor man comics? Glad you can make it because you're first in the chat. So I'm just going to assume you've been watching this whole time. <laughs> um, but I do want to see Wizard succeed because uh, it, it'll always have a special place, you know, in my mind just because it, it kept me into comics along with, you know, some good stories in the early 2000s. Uh, but just getting a chance to meet the creators and that stuff was a very cool experience for me. And it's been emulated many times ever since. I don't, I'm guessing San Diego was one of the first conventions. Obviously, Wizard World was not first to the game, but it seemed like Wizard was the first to like go to multiple cities and try out a convention just to see what would happen. Um, so, like I said, there's the Texas one. And the first one I went to in Chicago, I believe, was 2004. 
So Kevin Smith, like I said, you're going to see a lot of the same names. Kevin Smith, Kelly Hu, from way next to the big. And I missed out on meeting Joss Whedon. I'm still kind of bitter about that, but I at least got to go to his talk. So that would have been super cool to get something signed by Joss Whedon because Astonishing X-Men number one, I think, just rolled out at this time too. So that's why I'm like, I'm driving to Chicago. I got to go to that convention once I heard Whedon was there. Uh, so yeah, like I said, and you can kind of see it in this one a little bit. They kind of start off with the celebrities, so. And then, yeah, the celebrities get bigger, so it's just, I guess this was the beginning of it right here. Um, and of course the prices, I think it was like 10 bucks to meet Ferrigno, <laughs> Lou Ferrigno from the Hulk. Uh, so to give you guys an idea how much it was to meet people then, as it is now, it's like 50 bucks plus is a good price. Like, yeah, no it's not. <laughs> Um, other than that, I think that's all I brought with me to show you guys. Uh, if you guys have tuned in for this long, thank you so much. Uh, especially on a comic book Wednesday, I know a lot of people are making videos tonight on hauls and probably live streaming now. Um, oh yeah, if you guys watch it on the rewind, I'll show the uh, top 10 books. Gen 13's on all the uh, wizard top 10s in the 90s. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and wrap it up. So thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, Friday, 10 p.m., the seven will unite. So get my fingers ready once again. Uh, the old horseman fingers, like the four horsemen, I guess we're going to be the seven. So the seven will unite, 10 p.m., Friday night. I'll be there. Thank you guys so much for watching and take care.